Yeah, thank you very much. Um, good evening. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, welcome to the book discussion today. It's the book talk uh, entitled Exhale, an Anthology of Queer Singapore Voices. Thank you very much for Zubi Yusuf um, for the opportunity for us. And we are so excited to listen to your talk today. And we are also would like to um, welcome Ikuko. Ikuko is the faculty member at the Arts Faculty of the University of Melbourne. But first of all, before we start our discussion, uh, we would like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodian of the land in which um, we are all meeting today. I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodian of this land on which I stand here in Melbourne. I would also like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present of the Kulin Nation and extend that respect to other indigenous Australians present and emerging. The sovereignty of this land has never been ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. And to begin, um, please welcome Ikuko to give an opening and welcome remarks from the arts faculty of the University of Melbourne. The time is yours. Thanks so much, Pippin. Um, my name is Ikuko Nakane. I'm from the Arts Faculty, University of Melbourne. I'm the Associate Dean Diversity and Inclusion. And it is my great pleasure to welcome everybody to this um, book talk. But this is really the first of a series of events happening um, and supported by uh, the Faculty of Arts. And we are so excited about um, this book uh, talk as well as the next talk next week happening next week and um, the exhibition in in October as well. Um, so I would also I'm also I have to remind um, everybody here that I'm also participating from the um, the traditional land of Wurundjeri um, where University of Melbourne stands and I would like to pay respect to the elders past and present and emerging. Um, so, yeah, it is really um, a very um, exciting opportunity to, um, to hear all sorts of talks and to see exhibitions uh, on the theme of queer Muslim. And I am quite um, sort of really excited to learn about um, the book um, from Zubi <laughs> and then also, you know, ensuing discussion. Thank you so much and um, a big welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ikuko. So now I'm going to introduce our speaker today, Zubi Yusuf. She is a certified facilitator and motivator, motivational presenter. She has been working with individuals, organizations, and private institutions to amplify uh, their communication, connection, and confidence so that they can make an influence impact to the community and society. She is a founder of the Healing Circle, SG, a safe space for LGBTQ plus Muslims to reconcile with their faith through book therapy, one-on-one -on -one counseling and learning Islamic spirituality through book study. She also mentors um, and guiding her community to effectively strengthen and elevate their personal leadership vision, vision to the new heights. And one of the most important thing that um, we can learn from Zubi today is all about authenticity and being true to yourself. And she's also a writer where most of her stories have been published through publication in Medium. And she's also one of the writers of a book recently published called Exhale an anthology of queer Singapore voices. Like the book itself, um, it's like 500, 500 uh, pages. Yeah, Zubi, <laughs> it's quite thick. And people call that as a pink brick because like it's literally like a brick and it's pink. And it's so excited to, um, uh, Zubi will read one of the poem as well today. And without any further ado, please welcome Zubi Yusuf. Thank you so much, Pippin, and thank you to uh, KIST and also the University of Melbourne and the Faculty of Arts for inviting me for this uh, beautiful event. 
and uh, for making uh, an opportunity on Sunday evening. It's lovely. Uh, okay, uh, I should st start by saying that uh, I would like to thank the publisher of this uh, book, or rather the editors of this book, because without them, uh, this book will not exist. Um, and um, I would like to say thank to Eng Yixing, who's the first people who approached me to put my uh, story into this book. Uh, he's also one of the editors for this book. And Stephanie Chan, Andy Ang, An Jin Yong, Tan Bun Hui, Atifa Othman, and Kokila Anamalai for being such wonderful editors who compile all these stories since in the early 2010s. Uh, the stories, the prose, the poems from all writers from various ethnicity, uh, various faith, and um, they are all Singaporeans and various genre actually. So um, what really happened is that uh, Eng Yixing has saw my story in, uh, which was originally published by Aware, uh, that's entitled Growing Up Perempuan. So that story, uh, Si Ganjil, he says that uh, he would like to post it for, for last year. That means this was published last year's during Pride Month. So he would like to be part of this, uh, my story to be part of this book. And I, without hesitation, I say, yes, why not? Let's put this story into it because uh, th this story is about conversion therapy that I went through and it is still going on within our community. Whether you're a Muslim or you're a Christian, conversion therapy or rather conversion trauma has been you know, around within the community. Even though they claim that it's not being exercised or practiced anymore. So I shall begin by saying that, um, I will start with the story that, that how I get this inspiration is all about. It was happening during when I was in the 20s or rather late 20s, where that was the year in the 80s, late 80s, where the acronym of LGBT doesn't exist yet. Um, and is such a, a confusing state of mind for me because I was really young and I do not have the intention of being married or getting married with someone. Uh, I'm still seeking to un understand my identity as being a, a person because at that point of time, I don't even have the word to describe myself. Like, am I a queer? Am I this? And eventually when my mom asking me to go through the conversion therapy or rather, uh, mandi bunga or moon bath because uh, at that point I, I do not know that is a conversion therapy so the reason for my mom doing that is because a traditional Muslims when once they see a child who has reached above 25 years old the parents start to get panic and that's where uh, they will look for an elders you know uh, seek advice my mom is a religious teacher, right? So she started to seek advice from my grand uncle. And my grand uncle, who happens to be also a religious teacher, but he's also a Islamic healer. So he said to my mom that, you know, um, actually your daughter is a bit strange or ganjil in Malay. And uh, I think she has to go through all this, you know, uh, bathing with seven flowers in a bucket that's been recited with all the Quranic verses, uh, bathing below the moon bath, they call it. Or Malay will say mandibunga. So I do not know anything about all this until to the point that when I look back, when I'm in the stage of realization, when my mom passed away, I was 40 years old. That's where I realized when I dig up about knowing my identity, oh, 
this is what you call conversion therapy. And that's where I learned to write journal about what I have gone through in the past. Because through journaling, then I can understand where my journey is. And from there, I learned to understand that um, conversion therapy is not a good way of what people conservative would say, uh, the way for you to come back to being your fitra or being normal. But in other words, what is normal per se actually? So through this story that I'm sharing, my life story to the public, is because I feel it is important for me to tell the public the risk of going through this conversion therapy or conversion trauma. Uh, even though my conversion therapy is considered like it doesn't have a so-called uh, a physical sexual abuse, but it is still something that I do not want to go through anymore. It's uh, time consuming. It's uh, a lot of time that you have to go through in the middle of the night, past midnight, in a cold area and sitting in the four junctions and having a, a bath directly with the sun above you, uh, with the, sorry, with the moon above your head. I think that's really um, inappropriate, actually. Uh, because at that point of time, already wearing a hijab and I'm a daughter of Ustaza and yet I have to go through all this just to make myself or to overcome myself to become normal. So the story that I shared this is because it's really important for us to tell the public what we went through as a queer person. And besides my story, there are other stories that is uh, nothing to do with faith, but it's more about how they get to know each other secretly or how they express themselves for someone they had a crush with. And uh, there are beautiful poems here as well, you know, like the two girls dancing by Serafina women and, um, Oh, to happy together. Um, there are others, and there are well-known writers, which is, I think, um, they are more deserving to be in this event, to be honest with you. Like, for instance, um, Eng Yixing personally, you know, he's a award-winning prolific writer in Singapore. Or Alfian Saad, you know, who's part of the writers in this book. If I'm not wrong, there, there is about uh, 70 writers or 72 writers in this book itself. I'll show you, yeah. I don't know whether I can show it. Yeah. So, so that's how thick it is. <laughs> uh, it can be like a Quran or a Bible, right? <laughs> yeah, it is a pink brick. <laughs> uh, but again, you know, the story that that really captures me is, I think, every one of them. Because it tells the lived reality of who we are as a queer individual and how we live and how we strive ourselves living here in Singapore. And, um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for saying, yeah, it's not easy to go through that cleansing. And also, uh, I would like to also say that besides this writing, actually, I, I'm trying to write more of about queer lived realities besides myself. But however, I feel uh, after the announcement by the government, right, I'm going to go straight to there about the, they're going to repeal 377A. Um, we were very grateful that the government would like to do us, and we appreciate what they have done and trying hard to be a mediator between us and the conservatives 
And I think this repeal of 37A is just a tiny step. But to move forward, to go forward, to go through what we need to do, there's a lot of work, there's a lot of hurdles we have to go through. And for example, like for myself, right? In Healing Circle, our intention is this. Uh, whenever, uh, after this repeal of 377A, we have to be proactive in terms of the youth out there who happens to be uh, closeted with the family. They may be uh, trying to, you know, test their families saying or out to themselves being poor. Uh, this kind of thing as well is something that worries us as uh, an activist or advocates for poor Muslims because we, we know it's also it's a time of healing for everyone. Healing for the parents who doesn't know how to deal with a child who is poor. Healing in dealing how a child who is straight and having parents that happens to be poor, we may never know, right? Or healing where we have uncles or sisters or brothers or aunties who happens to say, I'm poor. How do we deal with this? And we definitely do not want when they out themselves or reveal themselves, their true authenticity to their family and loved ones, they are being pushed aside or being ostracized. That is not what we want. We want people come together out of love, not out of anger, not out of confusion, but out of respecting one another identity. There's uh, one person ever mentioned to me recently, they say that uh, identity will trump faith. That means identity is way more meaningful in life to be authentic than faith itself. But me as a Muslim, I feel that it has to come together because our prophet, our beloved prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, mentioned that if you want to know who is your God, you need to learn to know who you are. And as a poor individual like me, which I have gone through uh, not just one conversion therapy, I've gone through twice. And in this book, I stated that. And I would uh, encourage for you to read the book, buy the book and read the book. Because I'm not going to tell the whole story what's happening there. Go and have this uh, pink brick and keep it in your room and read it. It's beautiful. So, like I said, I have gone through two times conversion therapy. But I'm still a lesbian and a queer Muslim. And... The more I know myself, the more I try to recognize myself, I realize that the more I'm closer to my God, to my creator, to Allah. And I started to explore myself at the age of 40. And that the year where my mom passed away. And that's the year of realization for me as well. Because when I... Uh, when she left us, I realized that all these years, being a daughter of a religious teacher, I was not really be myself. Even when I do my five times solah or prayer, I wasn't really praying to the one and only God. I was doing it for the sake of the mother whom I love and I look up to. And at that point of time, I decided to leave Islam uh, spiritually. That means I do not do any um, prayers or fasting. Uh, I still wear hijab because I was closeted with my family. I do not want my family to know about it. And once I'm out of Islam, I try to find another place to, to understand who I am. 
I try to learn other religion, read their books, Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity. And all I can see is that they're all connected to some one being and that is God. But that one being has many facets of identities. And that give me a reflection of to realize that God itself, she herself, I call God she because my way of appreciating God for making me as a cisgender woman who happens to be a lesbian. And that's the reason why I'm using she. Uh, it has nothing to do uh, of being a heretic or anything, but people want to say that, go right ahead, I don't care. So this is how I explain myself. And also through this state of realization, I realized that I, I, I find my way back to Islam by going through all this religion, going through all this faith, and eventually the uniqueness of how I coming back to Islam is when I first had my first same sex love with someone and she's a Muslim and she's a lesbian and she's the one who brought me back to Islam. And people will always say, oh, that's not Islam. That is not the Islam that you need to come back. But the Islam that I received that point of time is Islam that teach me that God is not a punisher. God is not some uh, being that needs to be fearful all the time. But God is merciful, is gracious, is loving. That kind of God that I've discovered from her. And that's where it makes me to come back to Islam again. And uh, I would like to read the first page of the story that I have, the ganja, okay? Because I feel uh, just to give you some taste of the story of this. Siganjil, written by Zubi so that's me. Back in the 80s, there was no such thing as LGBT. You just knew it as Ganjil or Strange. That was what I was called by my Dato's daughter or granduncle. Strange. Because I didn't express any attraction towards the opposite gender. Instead, I was having crushes on my own gender. Yeah, I thought I was the Ganjil person too. I didn't know any better, but I did know that I was definitely more inclined to form romantic relationships with my own gender. When I was a hormonal teenager, my wet dreams had always been about women. Not one had any man in it. That's true. I could not even fathom the prospect of any sort of phallic penetrations into my most sacred and sensual space. I wish that time I had someone to talk to, but I remembered all too vividly that when I said to my mother that my teacher, Nak Brana, that means going to get, giving birth, she told me off for being rude. Kau ni anak dara, tak boleh cakap macam tu. It means, you're a virgin, you know. You cannot talk like that. Anything to do with the vagina was off limits. That's my mom. Much less the broader issues of sexuality. So I kept silent and remained confused. Imagine, at that point of time, I was in the 20s and the whole life of me, I'm being confused about, should I talk about sexuality? And it's so taboo, you know? 
uh, during those times. It really is a taboo. And um, the exciting part of the story is uh, during when I do the mandibunga or the moon bath. Uh, I'm not going to reveal it. I think the best thing is buy this pink brick. Then you know how the story is. All I could say that is um, quite comical though. <laughs> but I'm not going to reveal that. Now, going back to uh, conversion therapy, right? Now, um, based on my experience being with uh, people who come in and meet up with the healing circle, they told us the story what they went through uh, in conversion therapy. And one of them, um, before I say anything, is a trigger warning. Eh? If you feel you're not comfortable, please uh, just mute me. Um, there's this individual saying that um, the parent would hold her, her hands and then let the so-called religious healer touch her body. It's like more like molestation because the religious healer claimed that he's doing that is to get rid of all the bad spirits that comes into her, you know, all the genes that comes into her. And she, she in a state of realization, actually, she's not like going into trance. So to the point that she, she cannot do anything, she cannot kick the man because the parents was holding her. And the only thing she can do is she spit on the man, on the healer. She spit on him. Imagine a parents holding hands, all her four limbs, and she was struggling to release herself. And this healer was touching all over her. That is really dehumanizing. And it's very, I don't know what to say. It's the word is just really dehumanizing. It's very inhumane, you know. I don't think a, a farmer who look after their animals in a farm, they take care very well. You're a parent and you let a healer to touch your child that way. No way. That's really, really inhumane. And because of that, the angel person says she had no choice but to marry going through a marriage through convenience. So she met a, a gay individual, get married, have a family. Again, we are teaching our children who happens to be queer and try to be truthful to you, teaching them to lie to you, teaching them not to be true to themselves, teaching them to be not to be authentic towards the creator. Why? Because we only think that Islam is only one branches and that Islam is God that is the punisher, fearful, and God who, who really throw homosexuality to the fire of brimstone. Where else, that is not what God is. And I really hope that, you know, the most important message that I would like to give for the future generations of queer individuals here right now is that you have the privilege, the opportunity to be who you are. You have a channel of faces where you can go and say, hey, I need help. Compared to my time, I don't have anywhere to go. But to think, ah, maybe, yeah, maybe my parents is right. I need to be normal again. And during my time, filial piety is really important. So that's what I went through. Back again, I said the important message is that you have the privilege and the opportunity to go where you can explore yourself, to understand your identity. You know, you may never know. Maybe you are straight individual, 
but you have the right to explore yourself, your identity, to know yourself. Because a younger generations during this time, they are not the same as the younger generations during my time. They have a lot of um, information overload, like the social media. So their curiosity is really more advanced than we were before. And they have the right to understand who they are, to find their authenticity, to find their identity. And it has to find it from a place where they feel safe, like within a core organization like Healing Circle or other places that, you know, like Ugachaga or Sayoni or Proud or even Kwasa, you know. We should have that opportunity to do it. And it's really important to know who we are because that's obligatory. If you're a Muslim, and I believe even in, in Christianity, to know yourself is to know your creator. That's the main concept of faith. So if you want to know who is your creator, who created you and all that, it is important for you to know your identities. And once you know your identities, then you will feel more grateful for who you are. And I believe like, you know, for a poor person who happens to be a Muslim like me, recently, me and Reverend Miak of Free Community Church, uh, we were invited to do an interview with local media. But a few days later, the media called off and we don't have the platform to really say our you know gratitude and thanks to the government what they have done and the only way we can go through is through the uh what you call foreign media like you guys and i've managed to get interview from abc news australia and the irony part of it is when these journalists, local journalists heard about this and they say, hey, you know, you shouldn't go to uh, foreign journalists because they're very divisive. Uh, they create segregations within our community. But how can we express our appreciations that government will repeal 37A and how can we express that our concerns for the future next steps after Tristan said, A, if the local media do not give us that platform or opportunity to express. And the only way we can do that is through the foreign media. I can never say thank enough for the foreign media who's helping us to have that opportunity to express our concerns. And also, um, let's go back to the questions that uh, has been brought forward for me uh, before this event, is about the social acceptance in Singapore. Um, social acceptance in Singapore, uh, I must admit that I am grateful that I'm staying in a secular government such as Singapore. Because if I were to stay on a next door neighboring country, uh, it would be very risky for me being queer Muslim, you know. And I have to do all my things underground. But in Singapore, there are certain rules and regulations. Being in a secular country gives me the opportunity to really help uh, in an open space, you know, like in an openness saying, hey, this healing circle, this is me, look for me and I will help you. But you can't do that in the next door uh, country. <laughs> but however, we do have challenges because particularly for Muslims here, they are all conservatives. They are moderates also, but their moderateness I should say more inclinations towards conservatives. 
than progressive. For us, a Muslim organization, we are being called liberal. But we would like to say here specifically, we are not liberal. We are progressive. Because if you look at the history of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as we all know, Islam is part of Abrahamic religion. Muhammad is a reformist and progressive because he progressed the changes of the past religion, like the Judaism and the Christianity. And after that comes Islam. So if you want to say that Quran is a New Testament, yes, indeed. Quran is a New Testament, actually. And Quran is a book of God that trying to tell the past people of the book that these are the actual message or the actual stories that have been miswritten in the Bible and in the Torah. But God being merciful, right? One of the important things of being a, a faithful Muslims, we should not disrespect the Bible and the Torah and it's stated in the Quran itself. That's how wonderful God is, how merciful God is. Which sometimes uh, the conservatives do not see that. And they always relate us with the story of Prophet Lot or Prophet Lut rather. And they leave the stories of how homosexuality is a greatest sin of all. But in actual fact, the story that we believe in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah or story of the people of Lut is, is beyond that. It's a non-consensual sex and that is rape. It has nothing to do about homosexuality. In fact, the history of homosexuality doesn't only exist during the time of Lut. It's during the time of Byzantine, during the time of Mesopotamia, you know, in the olden days. And we may never know, maybe it exists even during the first time of creation of Adam and Eve. The only thing is we have a lot of missing translation, missing information from the old secret text. We need to dig through and trying to understand that there are missing links there. And for me, as a founder of Healing Circle, we always love to be invited by a religious authority to have a sit down and have a dialogue. Because I think dialogue is really important to acknowledge that we are here, we exist, and we just didn't want you just holding hands for us or asking us to overcome and being an overcomer, no. All we want is to acknowledge that there are poor Muslims and there are Islam that has different views than the Islam that we exist here, you know? Like for instance, I give you an examples. Uh, the difference between Shia and Sunni, right? Uh, their perception, their ideology is different, even Sufism. So Islam narratives, it has many branches. It's spread all over the way, all over the place. But those branches link to one God, and that is Allah. One evidence to show that our prophet, our beloved prophet, encouraged that branches to spread is when our beloved prophet said to his sahabas and to all his apostles, I have sent you all the message about Islam. It is time for you to preach all over the place. Preach Islam based on your understanding. That's a first clue that our prophet embraced diversity in Islam 
embrace the variations of ideology to go and lead to understand one and only God. Because the only person that understand the Quran deeper than anything else is our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that sacred text has been almost 1500 years. And this is why as a Muslim, we need to always have an open heart an open mind to other people have different ideologies or perception about Islam. Because I believe every religion, not just Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Baha'i, Hinduism, Buddhism, even Taoism or Sufism, all belongs to the one and only God. And I think we should learn to embrace that. We should learn to understand that. Because in Surah al hujurat verse 13, God did mention that somewhat like this, okay? I'm not going to translate everything in the Quran specifically. But God says, Oh, you believer, I've created you, okay? Through men and women. Now, when, when it's stated that through men and women means, that doesn't mean that, oh, our identity is only men and women. Means to create human being, we need the chromosomes of male and female. That's what it means. So to come together uh, from people of various creed, race, religion, and faith to get to know one another. That is obligatory. That is also a sign that God says, if you know who you are as a creation, and if you learn to understand people of various creed, various race, culture, even faith, that is part of you, your duty to be in this world. And that is a khalifa. That is leadership. Leadership that God gave is to every one of us. And one important thing is to be kind, to respect one another, to acknowledge one another with compassion, with patience, and with love. And also, I hope that, you know, I really hope that the dialogue that we're going to have with the conservative Muslims will always encourage everyone to really open their mind, unlearn Islam, and to see that Islam is not only one narrative. It has many narratives. And also to face the stigma and discriminations, right? Uh, here's how it, sh it should be done. When you're facing stigma and discrimination from people around the world or from people within your own country, like for me as a queer Muslims, uh, the most important thing is build more network that is non-Muslim. Network of core organization that is non Muslim because they know our plight, they know our concerns, they know that we need help. And somehow, we able to have that kind of help from other organizations here in Singapore. It really feels very patriotic because I never feel a true Singaporean when. Other core organizations that is not a Muslim, that is non Malays, reaching out their hands to us and say, hey, come, I help you. What do you want? What do you need? I think that's really wonderful. That's really Singaporean. You know? And I, I love to keep that all the time. 
and like uh, our relationship with Free Community Church, with uh, Reverend Miyak and Pastor Pauline, uh, we help one another, you know, and that's also another camaraderie of how interfaith comes together in our poor community, and that's wonderful. I will always cherish that because if you have that kind of family, you, no matter what discrimination or stigma that you're going through or you face, you know you have your backup. You know you have the people there for you. And this is, this is the thing that I really love what I'm doing right now. Because we really help one another. Because all the pain that we've gone through, especially the 377A, and now the government will repeal and lift up this Section 377A. Personally, I've never thought that that would happen during my time, and it does. And uh, I thank everyone for their prayer. And this prayer is not just come from our co-Muslims, but from every one of us. God hears our prayer. And if the, if the conservatives is here to hear it, I'm sorry, but I believe God is merciful. And God all knoweth. And this proof that God accept your prayer. And it's not for you to say that being a queer Muslim, our prayer is not being answered. Uh, last but not least, I'm going to um, recite a poem here. It's not from the book, but it's more about what I went through as a queer Muslim and what all our queer Muslim here in Singapore went through. And I think it's best to have this uh, poem to be set here in this beautiful event. It's an inspiration from the Surah Ar-Rahman, where Allah mentioned these sentences, uh, Oh, which of your Lord bounties will you and you deny? 31 times, 3, 1, 31 times in this Surah Ar-Rahman. So my poem entitled, Sometimes I Wonder. Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that we would grow beards and trying to look like a saint. Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that women in polygamy will be rewarded with golden umbrella. Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam, where child marriages is like a trend for an old man to marry. Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that men can treat women as a second class citizen. Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that we can say halal and haram profusely without any compassion for others. Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that we can judge people whether they are entitled to go to paradise or hell. Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that we can slander other Muslim who is not wearing hijab. Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that we are entitled to ask others, how many times do you pray in a day? Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam, we can say those who didn't pray five times a day are not Muslims. Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that we can say takfir for those who have different views of Islam. Sometimes I wonder, if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that only men can be scholars while women are just followers. Sometimes I wonder 
if Muslims think that God gave us Islam, to think that we are the only believers who deserve paradise and others do not. Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that only Muslim can translate the Quran and not the other believers. Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam, that only the clerics and scholars are entitled to translate the Quran. Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that Sunnis can proclaim Shiites as apostates or vice versa. Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that we can say there's only one narrative and reject the rest due to ego. Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that we can kill all the apostates. Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that we can say poor people can be Muslim. Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that we can say gays and lesbians are sinners and they are doomed to hell. Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that we can say poor Muslim prayers will not be accepted by God. Sometimes I wonder if Muslims, sorry, sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that this world will be in peace. Are we? Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that Islam can abolish racism. Have we? Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam, terrorism will be eradicated. Does it? Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that we can say this is the religion of truth. Have we been truthful? Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that you can just blindly follow your scholars without questioning or thinking. Is that so? Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that we can say, oh, my sheikh, my ustad, my ustaza is better than yours. Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that we can stand up for the Muslims only and neglected the others? Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam so that we remove all the worldly things while the global warming is being brushed aside? Sometimes I wonder if Muslims think that God gave us Islam to worship God in fear while absence in love. And lastly, and I wonder if all that I have been mentioned here just now is who we are as a Muslim. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Zubi. Thank you for the beautiful and igniting uh, poem and very in inspirational talk. It's very emotional. And um, thank you so much for sharing um, your story and also the inspiration. And we have plenty questions in here. And also if the audience would like to um, ask the question in person, you can also okay. activate your um, hand raising and indicate yourself. Uh, but before we continue, I would like to say thank you so much to Farah for translating the talk from Zubi and also a special thanks to Queer Islamic Studies and Theology or KIST, which is based in um, Indonesia to organizing. Um, they've been organizing this meeting and also the, uh, the series of event, the Queer Muslim in Conversation. And I would like to invite once again from the audience if they would like to ask the question. Okay, maybe I will start uh, with the Q&A. We've got 
plenty of question here. Okay, I would like to start with the first question. This is very interesting from uh, one of the attendee. Do you ever thought that Islam is not safe for you and how you can negotiate with it until you meet peace between your Islam and your identity as, queer, as a queer? How is uh, the process? Uh, would you like to share with us about that? Let's see here. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, that, that question is really deep. Um, to be honest, Islam is always a very safe and peaceful religion. It's the Muslims actually. It's the Muslims who has this kind of, you know, understanding that uh, whenever they do their so-called prayer, right? right? and they meet a lot of preachers and they, they think they're, they're entitled to question you, to judge you. So I would like to ask back these Muslims who likes to do this behavior, um, is that the Islam that our prophet asked us to practice? Is that the Islam that will bring compassion, caringness, understanding, the way our prophet does with people who sometimes trying to murder him, not to kill him. But when they met him, when they see how his character is with love and compassion, they decided that, hey, He's a humble soul. So where does, rather not Islam, but where does this ideology comes from? Because I don't see that as Islam. Because my Islam taught me that you can't play fire with fire. Uh, you, you have to be different than fire. You have to be the earth who cover the fire or uh, the water will cover the fire. Because if you are playing fire with fire, that is not Islam that you always every day recite Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, most merciful and most gracious. If we really recite that and internalize it during our prayer, we would not do those kind of things. We would not be very judgmental we will not feel that Islam is not safe. We will feel Islam is safe. It's just the people that are around it, their ideology, their way of thinking, something gone wrong. And you know why? I tell you why. Because if you were to see the transliteration of the Quran in the older days, right? It's very, patriarchal mindset is being written, rewritten by male elites to make as a book. And this is the reason why it has been, you know, developed and created and, and eventually it becomes more patriarchal. I'm not asking that, oh, Quran has to be matriarch. No, we has to find the middle ground where that middle ground really reinstate the word Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. And that's how I find peace with my Islam. Uh, and I think that's the reason also why Allah wants me to get out of Islam after, I, after my mom passed away. It's for me to come back to Islam in a different way. To come back to Islam, Islam that I've longed for, Islam of mercy, Islam of graciousness, Islam of compassion and love. I hope that's the only thing I can say to you, uh, because it takes time for you to understand Islam the way I do. I know it's hurtful to see, you know, everywhere the story, if you were to see other country with uh, shootings everywhere, and most of it is terrorism, right? Created by who? By the Muslims. 
But that's not my Islam. That's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Zubi. I think uh, what you just said should be heard by the whole Muslim in the world. I guess we should really amplify what you just said. And um, the next question is actually related to the, the idea of opening the dialogue. So I'm opening the dialogue to um, the public related to the, the, the value of diversity in uh, Islam, which you always mention about embracing diversity. So one of the attendee uh, mentioned in here, it is interesting that you mentioned about the dialogue with the conservative Muslim, like in bracket. Do you have any experience and is there any suggestion on how to open the gate for dialogue without feeling defensive? Um, the attendee who asked the question said that, um, I found it very hard to start the dialogue when at the back of my head that um, I always have a, like a, a worry that they will judge me because of my sexuality. Yeah, that's the question. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll be honest with you, it's not easy. When I first had a closed door dialogue with the conservatives, right? And there are groups of uh, Asatizas, you know, who is sitting across the room. And that first time of uh, dialogue, I was a bit afraid and confused. Yes, uh, it is okay for you to have at the back of your mind that people will judge you. But to me, is this, Bismillah. You judge me now, that shows that that's fine with me. As long as my intention to come in for Allah, and I hope in the hereafter, Allah will not judge me. This is my mindset that I have. And... Yes, that first uh, dialogue with conservative one individual, I have a teeth with him uh, because he claimed this, okay? Uh, don't get angry, okay? Because this is, to me, the problem is that person, not me. Uh, he mentioned this. He says that, um, you know, queer people, he never even mentioned Muslim. Poor people, there's no need to help them. They're very independent. They're very educated. They know how to survive. Uh, they work in financial sector. They are bankers. They are rich people. Okay. And then he says, i rather help people with a true disability because that's more rewarding. And I'll get, you know, reward from Allah. I was like angry, frustrated at the time. And my body was shivering, you know? And I, I stood up and I said, the people you mentioned are the people who happens to be not a queer Muslim. The queer Muslim in Singapore, we've gone through a lot of struggle. We've gone through a lot of dilemma. Besides being minority, okay? It's difficult for us to reveal ourselves being queer because people would not accept us if you want to work in a government sector and all that. It's not easy, okay? You, and then there are, most of them are closeted, queer Muslim. They are fear to show that they are queer. Unlike other queer people who is not Muslim, those are the people that he mentioned but not the core Muslims that I've met personally. And to have this kind of dialogue eventually, you know, slowly when you get used to meeting with them, you get used to it. You will know, okay, the next step, what are these people going to do? Of course, not one day of dialogue, they will change. The purpose of dialogue is not to change. The purpose of dialogue is to tell them we are here as a queer Muslim. We are part of the society. And we have this dialogue to let you know, we acknowledge your belief in Islam 
and we want you to acknowledge our belief in Islam. That's it. If we are able to find that common ground, subhanallah, you know, that's one. But that's not always possible, to be honest. But I strongly believe that with dialogue, one day, at least one of them, out of hundreds that you've met in your lifetime, will say, Zubi, let's sit down and talk. Let's find ways that we can acknowledge that Islam is a religion that has many branches that leads to one God. Now, if I have that kind of people, I would say, please, let's have dialogue. Let's find ways to talk to one another. Because I think that's what we, we want and that's what we need. And must, we must not give up. No matter how tired it is, we must not give up. Being um, a founder of, of this organization, I also need to take care of my mental wellness. Huh? <laughs> It's not easy. Sometimes I need to shut down and just find my me time and recuperate and recharge because that's really important. Because if you don't recuperate and recharge, then it's not easy for you to come back again and stand up for your rights and for your poor community. I hope that answers your questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I already noted that don't forget to uh, recharge. This is very important because sometimes when we are trying to uh, convey the yeah. peaceful messages and even in a peaceful way, sometimes uh, we 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 didn't get the same feedback from from other from our counterpart. It happened a lot in Indonesia. I'm from Jogja, by the way, and in Jogja, yeah. as we know, <laughs> there's been like a couple of accident. Um, not not accident actually, but it's like literally attack towards the uh, Muslim queer in Jogjakarta. So, thank you right. so much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate what you um, what you uh, said, and um. We still have a couple of questions and all of them are important. So I'm going to read out the next uh, questions. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think the younger generation in Singapore and maybe other places that you know will be more open to the idea of negotiating between queerness and faith or would they be more likely to choose one over the other or um, could you please also uh, elaborate if you see any uh, trends among the young people, like in Singapore or in, in any other place? Mm, um, I must admit today's generations uh, is, they taken lightly about faith. I don't deny that. Um, but I also believe, you know, Life is like a, like a wheel, you know. A certain generations, they will feel like, oh, religious is taken very lightly. Then eventually something happened, you know. People come back to, it, to, to religion again. Like, for instance, example, 9-11, right? When that happens, what happened? A lot of people want to know what is Islam, what is Christianity, what is this? So it's always a cycle. And today's generation, I think, because of the dilemma, uh, because of the brutality of religion that they have seen in the media, okay, that makes them think that, is it worth to have religion in their life, right? And now with the advanced science and technology, they would say, hey, I believe in science. I think science is really important than knowing whose God is, you know. Eventually, you know, uh, this kind of thing will never happen because whenever uh, conservatives or whenever we see a calamity happen in front of us, uh, faith, uh, a faithful person, person with religion will say, oh God, this is the end of time. 
But younger generation will say, the end of time, when? Some don't even believe that the earth will explode, <laughs> right? Because they believe that it's our duty to look after the climate change here. Uh, if it happens to be happen, uh, something wrong with the earth, it's because we don't take care of it. And that kind of mentality, they don't see that God exists. They don't see that it's, that's nature takes its place. And they don't see nature as God. They see nature is part of our human uh, cycle, you know, to, to create this earth to be harmonious, right? And I don't deny there are uh, younger generations who take lightly about faith and religion. They have the right to have their own views, you know? But what worries and concerns me is when they have parents who are very conservative and do not allow them to have their own critical mindset. You get what I mean? Because critical thinkers, nowadays, nowadays generation, their curiosity is different. They have a lot of critical thinking, critical mindsets. They question a lot of things to the point that those conservative parents, they don't even have the chance to explain to the, to the child because they don't know how, what the answer is all about. And that's the reason why we come back to the Surah Al-Hujurat verse 13 because God says, you are being created as human here is to keep learning, process, to understand. You cannot stop learning. You cannot say, oh, I'm old, I cannot remember. No, you need to learn. It's obligatory to be a learner in life. A lifelong learner is obligatory. It's obligatory to understand humanity. It's obligatory to understand why younger generations now feel faith is not important. So we need to understand this and not feeling sad, and not feeling so emotional, but to understand why, why it happens. You see, give you one good example. Our prophet, our beloved prophet, how does he find God? Through meditation, contemplations, and that's what he likes to do. And through meditations, that's where the calling comes. Gabriel, Angel Gabriel, come to him and say, you know, you have God. Sometimes you need to allow the younger generation to explore life. Because true life, whether in scientific advancements or philosophical, that's nuanced towards humanity alone, through there, they will learn who is the creator. I have no worries with these younger people. Because these people who don't believe in God, actually they're more receptive, understanding and respectful towards older generation actually, in their own ways. Huh? Not like, oh, uh, hello auntie, how are you? No, not that sort. What I meant is, they really sit down and talk to you and they want to know more, even though they don't believe in Islam or they don't believe in other religion. They love to see how you talk and they observe from there. And I respect the way they do. I really do. So I hope I answer your questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Zubi. Um, it's very, very interesting the way you put the application to understand humanity as a, as a part of being a, being a Muslim. I really appreciate that. And um, we are going to move to the next uh, question. This mm -hmm. is from Zeti. Um, she gave a comment before 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 I read out the question. I will also read out the comment from uh, Zeti. Thank you so much for the comment and question, Zeti. Um, this is what she wrote. Queerness, in my opinion, is prismatic, an ability to witness the full spectrum of light, especially the liminal of being polygangil or in between or even absence of light. 
like being a saksi, a shahid. Like you, I too temporarily left Islam and later reclaim it by linking with other queer Muslims, found Imam Amina Wadud and Mohsin Hendricks. It has helped me find commonalities in non-duality, Advaita, the Jawen, and even post-structuralist in interpretation of theology. It is not easy, as many of my queer friends have decided to leave Islam, especially in a secular country. I'm in Australia at the moment. It's a triggering topic for many. Yeah, uh, that's the comment from Zeti, and I totally can relate to what uh, Zeti just mentioned. Um, and the question from her uh, from Zeti is, how do you approach healing religious trauma without pushing theology? So our ex-Muslim queer friends also feel welcomed. Uh, that's the question. Thank you, Zeti. You know, Zeti, um. I've met Prof. Amina Wadud personally. When I first uh, tried to explore my queerness, uh, I Google, uh, during that time there's no Google, it's MSN. And I found, uh, they call it the Inner Circle, founded by Mohsin Hendricks. So when I hear his, uh, his uh, talk in, uh, during that video, in the inner circle, uh, I was really, it was really intrigued because it made me realize that, hey, uh, I'm not the only one who wants to see that am I queer can resonate with my Islam. And Mohsin Hendricks is the one that really opened the gates for me to understand Islam more. And Prof. Amina Wadud, uh, the first time that really makes me see Islam is very unique is when I saw her doing her prayer, right? Uh, as an imam. And I said, wow, this woman is very brave, you know? And to have the pleasure to, to have met her and uh, to host her when many years back before, before COVID, she came down to renew her visa in Singapore. It was, mashallah, it was a blessing to have her in my home. Yeah. And we, she talked a lot about Islam and how she encountered herself and why, why she do that uh, pray, a congregational prayer and being lead as an imam. It was wonderful. I think it's best to hear from her than to, from me. But to really sit down and hear what she's saying about it is remarkable, it's wonderful. So it, it really is a blessing uh, to be where I am now. And how do I approach the healing? Uh, it takes a lot of process. Um, because during that point of time, when I do the so-called the religious trauma or conversion therapy, you know, um, it wasn't an easy thing. And I, I gone through a arranged marriage and the marriage ended up a, a divorce. And I going through a lot of depressions as well. And I believe through that experiences, um, I look for people like me and at that point of time, there was this underground group, they call it Mufarida. So when, when the founder migrate to other country, they leave the organization to me. But uh, to cut it short, uh, I decided that, no, I do not want this kind of organization where you can't show your face. Because if you want to attract people or bring people in for safe space, you need a face. And I'm willing to take that risk. And that's where how Healing Circle is being established. Uh, and why I put the word healing is because every one of us that went through changes to find our authentic self, we're going through a lot of mental illness or wellness or mental health that's really crucial for us to go to a stage of healingness, right? 
And that's the reason why the word healing is that, the healing circle. And why the word circle? Because if you see the Kaaba, right? Uh, we circumambulate. And when we have a mushawarah or a discussion, we like to see everyone's face in circle, right? So that we are able to see and have connections. And that's why the healing circle is there. It's really important to have that. And through, through this organization, which started in the year 2016 until now, I never expected it to grow this, this much. That, and we have a pro bono counselors who are willing to help. And all of them are allies. Huh? Uh, they are not poor, except me. I'm the only poor counselor, but all of them are allies. And they really understand you know, the need of acknowledgement of our poorness and being a Muslim. <laughs> Uh, to be acknowledged. And the safe space that we give to our community is to give them the opportunity to express themselves freely and bravely. Why bravely? Because sometimes when you are out there all the time, you just need, like, we have a session of once a month. Sometimes, like this month, I think we do not have any session because uh, I'm quite busy back to back. But when they need to like, hey, Zubi, I need to talk to you. You know, the phone is the, the easiest, the, the, the nearest way to reach out to me. You know, okay, let's talk, let's discuss. Um, it's like not just building a, a small community, but rather a, a new family, you know. Family is really, really important in our poor community. Even though that family is not something that uh, through the lineage, but a family that you created, a family that you adopted, that makes you as a whole human being. I think that kind of family is something that is irreplaceable. That's how we go through our healing. That's how we go through the healing of religious trauma. And when you say, how do we get through it without talking about theology? Let's go back to our Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad is the best example of all of us we can follow. When Prophet Muhammad received the message from Angel Gabriel, right? Does he say, oh, Allah is one, let's say Shahada. He didn't say that. He go through in a very humanistic way. He approached people by setting example of himself. He just say, you know, I have this uh, encounter and I don't know what to do. And the first person he come forth to is his wife, Khadija. And he explained to Khadija what he went through. And Khadija dis did not dismiss him immediately. Khadija, in fact, embraced him. Why? Because Khadija is a person who's very educated woman. She's not just a businesswoman. She loves to read. She's the first person who read about the Bible, the Old Testament. And she explained, you know, my dear, what you encounter is what has been stated in the Old Testament. And that's why he brings his cousin who happens to be blind, but a person who remember and recites the Old Testament to him. And Khadija knew that's the sign that he is the prophet, the seal of the prophets, of all the prophets. It's all being planned by God. If we believe sincerely that our intentions is to find a true religion that would not be traumatic. God will lead us the way. God will heal us through this trauma that we went through. Like I said, Islam is a safe, peaceful religion. In fact, every religion teach that. 
but what makes it not safe, what makes it become more traumatic is the people behind that religion. When you have male elites who likes to control Islam as if that Islam needs to be controlled, who thinks that I'm a bouncer for God, you know? Who are you to tell me about Islam? You know, if these kind of people, yeah. These are the people that really makes you traumatic with their words. How are you going to heal that? Simple. When they say those, that, those kind of things, they are the ones who have an issue about Islam, not you. Find a like-minded people who believe Islam in a progressive way. Find people who understand what is religion, even though that person is not Islam. You know, because just look at our prophet, our prophet embrace our religion actually, you know, but we don't see that. It's just that his duty when God says, you have to tell, you know, that there is a, another religion called Islam and you are the prophet. You have to do it. That is your calling, man. So this is my calling. My calling is to bring queer Muslim together and to tell them that, hey, Islam is a religion of peace and love. And it's not a religion that is not safe. The one that makes it traumatic and unsafe is the people behind this religion. So you guys need to step up to become a better Muslim. And to become a better Muslim, as I mentioned just now, we cannot fight fire with fire. They play with fire, we become the earth. We overcome the fire. And that we need to learn, to learn how to be patient because that's how our prophet is. Go back to Rasulullah. Go back to see his, his true character, not through hadith, huh? because some hadith, they are so confusing. It's because of the, the, of the hadith that makes us poor people being discriminated a lot. Because in the Quran, does it stated about homosexuality? No. You want to see Rasulullah character? Simple. In the Quran says that Rasulullah is rahmatan lil alamin, a mercy to all creations. So if the hadith doesn't state the mercifulness character of our prophet, like he says, Oh, Prophet will curse people who put on tattoo. An example uh, of a hadith. Does that resonate with what the Quran stated about Rasulullah? No. So reject that hadith. I'm not teaching, I'm not saying that hadith is, is completely false. Some hadith do resonate with the Quran. But hadith that really discriminate you, full of bigotry, you know, full of tyranny and hatred. I think that's not what our prophet is. And it's shameful that this kind of hadith exists. And let me tell you the history of hadith. Huh? Between hadith and Quran. Okay. The compilation of hadith. The only authentic hadith that exists is this. Rasulullah says that whatever revelation I receive from God, please record them and keep them safely. But whatever I say, please do not record it. That's the most authentic hadith. But what happened? Almost 200 years after he passed on, his people start to compile the hadith. Thousands and thousands and millions of hadith that don't even resonate in the Quran. So what I'm saying is this, Quran is being approved by Allah and Prophet. Hadith is not being approved by our Prophet, not even by Allah. So think about it. I'm not teaching you to become a Hadith hater, no. Some Hadith is resonate, does resonate 
read the Quran. But most of them do not. So you have to be careful, analyze the hadith, see who's the chain of hadith, who's the people who hold the hadith, because it's not an easy thing to understand hadith. So to me, I would recommend that just read the Quran first. Because that's the best way to understand who is our creator. So I hope, Zeti, um, I answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Zuby. Being critical and scientific is always um, something that we should um, do yeah. when we learn. Thank you yes. so much. Yeah, that's very important and a strong, very strong message for all of us. Uh, this is going to be our last round of question and answer. And um, two of the attendees actually asked this almost the same questions. Um, can we expect any other literary from uh, literary work from you soon? And what other books would you recommend, uh, especially the ones that suit religious queers from countries like uh, Indonesia? Because we got like uh, some of the attendees from Indonesia as well. So any suggestion? Oh, okay. Mm. I would suggest this. Um, I believe there is a lot of queer writers that in Indonesia. The best thing is look for the queer writers that has published their books, whether in open or secretly, reach out to them, you know, listen to their stories. If they do not have any books published, sit down with them, sit down with them and hear their stories. Because the only way we, we can feel that we heal or the only way that we can acknowledge our identity is to be with the people with the local people, with the people around us that resonates with our lived realities. Because that's the best way to understand why we are born being queer and how can we appreciate being queer, whether you're a queer Muslim, queer Christian, queer Jew, you know, queer Buddhist. Uh, how do we appreciate? How do we learn to appreciate? through these live reality stories. You know, whatever uh, sessions or event that is open there, go for it. Listen. Listen with attention and passion and understanding. That's really important. Uh, for writing right now, um, I've been writing here and there, but it's more like journaling. But uh, I do not have at the moment right now uh, because I'm taking some courses that I go through and that doesn't permit me to do some writing. But inshallah, eventually I will start to write again. Thank you for asking. <laughs> inshallah. And we can still follow your work on Medium, right, Subi? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sure. And also uh, for the attendees and participants, if you're interested in the Indonesian literary uh, on queer related topic, you can stay tuned uh, with KIST, Queer Islam Islamic Studies and Theology. They are on website, I guess. Uh, we have Ersa and Farah here as the committee as well for the Queer Muslim in Conversation. So, uh, we can keep in touch with uh, KIST as well for the future reference. And um, this is the end of our book talk today. Thank you so much, um, Zubi, for a very insightful and powerful messages. I uh, really appreciate that. And actually, after this book talk, uh, we are going to request for the University of Melbourne Library to uh, get the collection um, for the Exhale book because we haven't had that in our library and we found that ah. this is very important book. Yes. And um, yeah, I think the next step that we are going to do is order the library to uh, 
get the book for the students at Melbourne Uni as well. And once again, thank you so much for the uh, arts faculty, the University of Melbourne, especially uh, Professor Dana and also Associate Professor Ikuko Nakane, who has been very supportive um, and uh, very helpful with um, the discussion on queer and also the LGBTIQ rights uh, for the student here. I'm very happy and very lucky to be part of the faculty who is actually uh, supporting and recognize the rights of the LGBT and queer students in here and also the staff member, of course. Um, and also uh, we would like to thank Queer Islamic Studies and Theology or KIST. Um, actually, um, the lady imam is one of our uh, chair as well. So she's, uh, she has been uh, advising us with the topic of the discussion and, and everything. So uh, Ersa and also Farah, uh, they have been very uh, helpful and organized this meeting as well. Thank you so much once again, and I hope we will see each other again in the next uh, time. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. See you all. Thank you, Zubi.